Fantastic. Well, I need you to be interactive today. You thought I was preaching today, but really you're preaching today. So I need you to be interactive. This is audacious church, okay, which means you can talk back. Your mom taught you that you couldn't talk back. But I'm telling you today, you can talk back. So if you want to stand up, say, good point, that's awesome, hallelujah, your hair's looking good, you can do that at any point during this message. Permission granted. (laughs) Behave, thank you, good. It's got really light in the sun. Anyway, we've just come back from two weeks in France. It was awesome, but I tell you, there is nowhere like home. So glad to be here. Nowhere like home. We are in the last week of our Neighbours series. It's been brilliant. We've been looking at how to create authentic, real relationships, authentic, real community. And we've been learning from the masters who are the early church in Acts. We've been looking at Acts Church and reading about the Acts Church. And I'm going to read it to you right now. And we've been learning about how we can create authentic relationships, being the best neighbors possible. Look at the person next to you who's your neighbor and say, I love you. Yeah, that was intense, wasn't it? (laughs) All right, here we go. Acts 2, 42. I'm going to read it. You can follow it on the screen, on your iPhone, whatever you're reading it from. It says this. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, that's us now getting together, gathering, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All of the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, that's what we just did, and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to the number daily those who were being saved. What a church! What a church. We would love for that to be about our church, audacious church. But I'm here to tell you, it is the same church. This is the church of God. And we want to learn some of the lessons from the Acts Church. And we've been talking about neighbors, kind of like the sayings of neighbors um, that we say. So what, what the first week we were talking about a cup of sugar. You know when you go to your neighbor, you knock on the door, and you ask for a cup of sugar. When I was younger, I remember my mom asking me to go and get an egg. Well, you ask your neighbor for an egg. So I had to knock on the door. I took it back. I squeezed it. I broke it. And then I actually went home and told them they didn't have any. (laughs) Little insight into my childhood. So we're talking about generosity that week. And natural over the fence, I spoke to you guys about the importance of communication. And we were last... uh, Pastor Paul Reed spoke last week about Neighborhood Watch, about the protection that we find within community. And Mark Foster spoke about consistency. His title is Putting the Bins Out the consistency that you need within community. This week, the title of our message, if you are taking notes, is this. Feed the cat. I know, I don't even have a cat. I have a guinea uh, guinea pig called Spike. But feed the cat. And this is what we're thinking, is there is a process to your neighborhood, kind of your, your relationships with your neighbors. You don't just dive straight in and say, hey, what's your job? What do you do? You talk about the weather, first of all. Hey, how come you're back? Okay, good. That caught me by surprise. You talk about the weather, you talk about surface level stuff, and then you talk about the bin policy, kind of like when does the bin goes out, who knows when the green bin goes out, I don't know when the bin green bins out. And then you talk about putting the bin back, whoever gets back from work first. You take your bin, and of course you take your neighbor's bin as well, because that's the polite thing to do. And then there is this whole other level of neighborhood. There's a whole other level of relationship that you can step into, and it is the feed the cat thing, is when you give a neighbor a key to your house. Next level. Basically, it's normally because you don't want your pet or your plants or something to die. So you're like, hey, here's a key to my house. It's like next level. Maybe you don't have a pet or you didn't give them a key, but there's a next level moment with your relationship when you invite your neighbor to actually come into your house. Like they enter your house. Like the driveway feels safe, doesn't it? You're like, this is where we talk. This is where we talk about the weather. We keep it surface thing. But then it comes to this point where you're just like, do you want to come in for a brew? Or maybe at Christmas time, you're like, hey, do you want to, do you want to come in for like mulled wine? Or, or they're like, I want to see what you've done with the place. And you're like, it's a next level thing. When they actually come into your house. Normally, because they're like, oh yeah, I'll come around in like 10 minutes. And you're like, okay. And the first thing you're thinking is this. I've got to clean this thing up. Like my house is a mess. So you're like, 10 minutes, no problem. Soon 10 minutes, I'll put the kettle on. And you get into your house. We've all done this. You know when your house is a tip? We do it before life group, don't you? You're like, life group, they're going to come in like 10 minutes. Oh, my goodness. And you do this thing, right? 
when it's a turtle tip, it looks like you're losing a game of Jumanji. And you're looking around and you're like, what do I do? You've got two things you can do. Number one, nothing. You don't do anything. They walk through the door and you just say this. Don't touch anything. The police are on their way. We've been broken into. <laughs> you can go with that, okay? If you don't like lying, the other thing you can do is you pick up all the stuff and you stuff it in the place where you stuff all the stuff. You've all got one of those things. It's like the everything thing. Depending on what life stage you're at, the everything thing is a different thing. If you're single and you just live by yourself, it's probably like a bowl, like a key bowl or something. You just like put the stuff in there. When you get married, it becomes a drawer. You have an everything drawer. A drawer that you put everything in and then you just close that drawer. When you have kids, the drawer becomes a cupboard. You're like, like the Lego in there, that pan that I've not watched put in there, the washing goes in there. If you have more than one kid, it becomes a room. You're like, just put everything in that room. Like, if you're coming around to my house, my house will look like, you know, lovely, Pinterest worthy, just great. But there will be one shut door. And for your sake, don't open that door. Because there's stuff in there I don't want you to see. I don't want you to judge me for the things I've put away in there. It's a whole nother level when you invite someone into your house. So very often, we just don't really do it. We don't invite people into our house because often there's stuff in our houses that we're worried that people will judge us. We don't want people to see. And this can often be the way that we approach our relationships. Our relationships are supposed to progress past kind of the surface level conversations that we have, but how often can we stall kind of on the driveways of our lives where we just talk about the surface level stuff? Because the truth is, the stuff in our lives, we don't want people to see. You know, we, we're happy with the conversations across the school gates, the schoolyard conversations. You finish football training, we're happy with the 10 minutes afterwards. You finish school and you're happy with the conversation then or the end of church or the Facebook interactions. We're happy with that, but it's kind of like we stall on the driveways because we don't really want really, really, really to let people in because there's things in our lives we don't want people to see. We fear what they think. I've lived here. And what can happen, instead of having a community of authentic friendships, we have a crowd of acquaintances who sometimes think they know us, they think they're in, but you know they're on the driveway. You know you've not really let them in. You're with people, but the truth is they're not really in. The acquaintance thing, I've lived here for a long time of my life, and I, what I realized was this, that the acquaintances that you have in your life, they're not there for you when things get hard, because they don't know. They don't know when you're struggling. They don't know your fears. They don't know when you need an arm around your shoulder, because you just don't let them know. They also don't know when you celebrate the victories and the breakthroughs and the joy that you have, because they just don't know. And I've lived here. I've personally lived here, and this is how I felt. I felt seen, but not known. I felt counted, because I was there, but not connected. I felt noticed, but not needed. I was in a crowd, but I felt lonely. But I'm here to tell you this morning, that is not what God wants for us. That is not what God has for us. He wants you to be known by people around you like he knows you. He wants you to be connected, not just to him, but to the people around you. And he wants you to know today, church, that you have a purpose. So you are needed in the bigger picture. Genesis 2, God created everything and he said, it's good. I love this. It's good. And I love it. It's good. It's good. It's good. And then he saw one thing that he had made that he said, that's not good. It's when he saw a person alone. He does the same today. He sees people alone. You may be in a crowd and acquaintances, but you're alone. And God says, that is not good for you to be alone. You were born to have authentic, intimate, real relationships. You were born to be in a community where you are known, the good, the bad, the ugly, where you don't hide behind the mask of Facebook and Instagram and you're real of everything that's going on, but you say, come on in, know me. It's not all pretty. It's not all pretty, but I want to be known. 
Today is called Feed the Cat, but I want to talk to you about the power of vulnerability. Even saying it, we don't like to be vulnerable. Nobody likes to show their makeup off, no filtered them. Talking about vulnerability where people know the you that hits the pillow at night. The vulnerability, we come up with elaborate defense and cover-up systems to cover our weaknesses, to cover our shame, our pain, to cover our addictions, to cover our rejections, to cover our fears. But today I want to talk to you about the power that's in vulnerability, the power that we can find it. Here's the truth that I want you to remember, that opening up will actually bring you into the freedom that you desire. Opening up, opening who you are up will actually bring you into the freedom that you really, truly desire. So today I'm going to talk about a little bit about the fruit that comes from being vulnerable, learning to be vulnerable. Are you with me, church? You've gone quiet, but I want you to preach this with me, okay? Here we go. The first thing that happens if you're taking notes is this. This is what vulnerability does. It breaks isolation. It breaks isolation. In Acts, this is what I think the keys to the early church was vulnerability. In Acts 2, it says this. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Being sincere means free from pretense and deceit. It means being real. They, had, they were honest with each other. They had real, honest conversations. And it says this, that, that they moved from just meeting in the temple courts to meeting in their homes every day. They weren't just together, but they were together and they were honest. You know, the enemy isn't scared of you being with people. He just doesn't want you to be honest. He wants you to be isolated. He wants you to be alone, not physically alone. He wants you to feel alone. He wants you to be isolated. And the way, the trick of the enemy that he does that is he whispers to you about the stuff and he creates fear. He's a fear monger. He says this, what would people say? What would people think of you if they knew that? It's like why you don't let people in your house. I walk around my house and I'm just like, oh my goodness, look up there. There's like a crack in this and I've got all this washing here. And I fear what people would think of me. I fear judgment. But how much is it the same in our own lives? We know what's in the everything room of our hearts. We know what's behind the door. We know our pain and our shame and our guilt. We know our addictions. We know our thoughts life. And we say, what would people think? And the enemy says, let me tell you what people would think about you. And he keeps you isolated and alone on the driveway of your life saying nobody wants to go in there. When I was a teenager, I was in a relationship that was abusive. And um, like any relationship, any kind of abusive situation, the person who is being abused often feels like it's their fault and carries a sense of shame and guilt and pain. And the truth is, the shame, guilt and pain that I felt, it lasted much longer than the relationship did. Because I thought, what would people think? What would people think of me? What would people do if they knew, if they knew how I was, how I'd behaved, what I allowed to happen? So I shut the door, I put it in my heart, and I shut the door. And the enemy started to speak in the darkness. Whisper to me. Until, do you know what, one day I just made a decision, I can't do this anymore. And I understood that opening up would actually bring me the freedom that I truly desired. So what I did this, I choose one, chose one person. Not everybody, I just chose one person. And I sat with them and I made a decision that a moment of exposure for a lifetime of freedom, and I just started to tell them. Do you know what it was like? It was like that person took me by the hand. We walked off my driveway. We walked to the door, into my house. We opened the door and it was like my friend who sat with me, she turned on the light. She brought it into the light. And she said, we can sort through this together. We can talk about this together. Do you know what it did in that moment? It disarmed the enemy. It said, enemy, where is your sting? Where is your power now? It brought it out into the light. It broke the back of isolation. You're here today and the enemy's whispering to you. And the, what vulnerability can do to, for you is break the back of isolation. The second thing that it can do, vulnerability, is this. It can bring strength. Vulnerability brings incredible strength. You think it doesn't. You think it weakens you. 
But opening up will bring you into the freedom that you actually desire. It brings incredible strength. Acts 2 said this, verse 45, it says, they sold their property and their possessions to give to everyone who had need. In Acts 4, 32, it goes on to talk about um, this, and it says, no one claimed that their possessions were their own, but they shared everything they had. Verse 34 says, and there was no need in person among them. There was a need, and then there was no need. Something happened in the middle. It was called vulnerability. The moment where somebody said, I have a weakness. I have a need. I need to tell somebody. A moment of exposure for a lifetime of freedom. Opening up will bring you into the freedom that you actually desire. When we hide it, it makes us weaker. I asked Sparky to make sure that you all had a pen. All I want you to do is give it up for the pen, yeah, sure. I, I want you to pick up your pen right now, grab your pen. And I want to show you something. On your right hand, I want you to write what you think your weakness is. The thing that you can keep it small, you can write it in initials, you can write it in shorthand, you can just write weakness if you want. You're not going to show it to anyone, okay? You're not going to show it to anyone. In a minute, your hands are so sweaty, it'll come right off. Now, I know what you're thinking. You can hear your teacher in your head, can't you? Thinking ink poisoning. <laughs> I googled it, that's not a thing. Okay? So I want you to write on your right hand your weakness, even if you just write W for weakness, but you know what it is. I want you to write on your left hand your strength. The weakness is the thing that makes you want to cry. It keeps you awake at night. You hate it. If you could get rid of it, you could get rid of it. Your strength is the thing that you bring to the table. I think even deep down, most of us know, even if it's just that you're kind, that you have a bit of courage. If it's a gift or a talent, you can write that on there. I want to show you the strength that vulnerability brings. You see, the first thing that we have to do is this. I want you to hold your hands closed like this. Put your pens down if, you, if you've done it. If you haven't done it, just hold your hands like this. Pretend that in your right hand you've got your weakness and in your left hand you've got your strength. I want you to hold them closed. Apart, but closed. See, what we have to do is vulnerability brings strength. And the first thing you have to do is you don't just surrender your weaknesses to God, but you send, surrender your strengths as well. 2 Corinthians 12, Paul was brilliant at this. He said this, God said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. Paul says, therefore, I'll boast all more gladly of my weakness, so the power of Christ might rest on me. For when I am weak, he is strong. The first thing you have to do is and I want you to do this, is I want you to lift up your hands closed, and then I just want you to open them like you're worshiping God. This is your moment of vulnerability with God, where you say, God, I give you my weakness, and God, I give you my strength. Every time you worship God, I want you to remember what you're doing in that moment. You're opening your hands, vulnerability, saying, God, I give you my strength, and I give you my weakness. But here's the thing, the incredible thing that sets us apart from any other organization is this is what the church of God is. We're not just vulnerable before God where we open our hands to Him and say, I give you my strength, I give Him your weakness. But right now, I want you to lower your hands and I want to hold you to hold the hand of the person next to you and then hold the hand of the other person next to you. And I want you to see that your strength is in their weakness. And your weakness is in their strength. Strength, weakness. Strength, weakness. Strength, weakness. This is the picture of the body of Christ. This is a picture of vulnerability. This is the strength that vulnerability can bring. Earlier on in this year, I had, you can let hands go for a minute. Earlier on this year, I had a hard time. Stuff was going on in my heart. And I'm, my personality is I want to eradicate all weakness. I want to get good at everything I do. But in that moment, all I needed to do is I needed to sit with someone. And I needed to cry. And I needed to talk. And I needed to be honest about my weakness. And I needed that person to say, do you know what? I've got you. I've got you. In this season, I've got you. I'm going to give you my strength. Knowing that maybe later on, 
I'll do the same for them. This. That's the picture of the church. That is the picture of the church. Stop trying to eradicate your weakness before you connect. Stop trying to clear up your life before you make a relationship. Stop trying to sort it all out before you actually let someone in. The third thing, and then we're going to spend a little bit of time with God and a little bit of time connecting with each other like we've been doing, is this. The third thing that vulnerability does is it builds unity. It builds unity. Acts 4, 32 says, All the believers were one in mind and heart. They were united. Psalm 133, it says, How good and pleasant it is when God's people live in unity. And it says this, that God commands a blessing there. Unity will bring a, bring a blessing. When you're by yourself in a crowd of acquaintances, you sometimes feel like you're keeping yourself safe by not opening up. But actually, you're not. You're not keeping yourself safe. You're stopping us from being unified. You're keeping yourself alone. When we keep things hidden, keep things in the dark, you're not keeping yourself safe. When we are vulnerable, we actually become united because we become one. As a teenager, I um, studied classical civilization. And I learned that in ancient Rome, what the Roman soldiers did is this. They learned that they had, they had shields and they had a, fir- a, a a formation called the tortoise. And what it was is they took their shields and they understood that by themselves they were exposed. But when they came together, and I think there's a picture going to come up screen, when they came together, they understood that actually they were unified. Unity means one. What would happen is one soldier would kneel at the front and they would put their, sword, their, their shield forward, but it would leave their head and their back exposed. So the person behind them would lift up the shield on them and the person behind them would lift up the shield on them and the person at the side would lift up the shield on one. And what's incredible about this formation is this, that they moved as one. They moved as one. Their battle became my battle. Do you know what? Your battle's my battle. Your fight is my fight if we're vulnerable. I'll stand with you if I know what I'm standing with you for. And then do you know what? Your victory is my victory. Because we move as one. What does vulnerability do? It unites us. It unites us as one. We move together as one. It makes us understand that we have a purpose. We need one another. We need one another. I need your shield. I need us to move as one to play our part. Opening up will bring the freedom that you desire. The actual freedom that you desire. We're going to spend some time with God now, but this is what you have to make a decision on. Choose today to refuse to let the enemy isolate you. Refuse to stay, to stall on the driveway of your life with a crowd of acquaintances who may think they know you, but you know they don't know you. Make a decision to say no. Decide what. First of all, what? What are you going to tell someone? What are you going to surrender to God? What today can you go to somebody and say, I'm going to lift the burden by sharing this with you. I'm going to open the door slightly and bring one thing out and say, come on, I tell you this. Who? Who are you going to talk it to? You've got to pick the right person. Just pick one person. Pick someone who's on the same page, page as you, who's full of faith, who you know is going to speak life. When? You've got to decide when. When am I going to do this? Do it now. Do it after church. Text someone after church and say, I need to tell you something. Then remind me, I need to tell you something. Relationships don't just fall out the sky. We have to be intentional with them. Have regular time with them. And do you know what it will do? It will create a community of people that are so attractive that other people will say, how to be a part of this? Tell me about your God. How do you live life the way you live life? But the truth is the enemy will keep us isolated. But today we can take a moment to be vulnerable before him and then vulnerable with other people.